broken heater wires, resin stuck to a Fresnel lens, and bad bottom benchies do not make the rocking world go round. All this and more, Print Fix Friday, episode 108. Let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. And if you're having issues with your 3D printers, you come to the right place. We do this series every single week to help you getting printing with purpose. And if you are having issues, you can reach out to us on all the social medias, slide into those DMs, or if you feel inclined, you can email us directly, youtube at 3dmusketeers.com, and we'll help you out. And it costs you literally nothing. We do this completely for free because we want you to get back printing rather than being immediately frustrated. But before we get too deep into Print Fix Friday, I got a cool announcement for you guys. This comes from a buddy of mine, Dom, or some of you know him as Geek Toy Box. He is actually one of the organizers of Maker Fair Orange County, not Orange County, Florida, Orange County, California. And unfortunately, while we won't be there, if you are in the area, you absolutely should be. It is on the 21st of October, 2023, at the Orange County Fairgrounds in Costa Mesa, California. They're trying to grow something special, covering all types of makers. The show and tell exhibitors are always free. Those are your maker tables, and they still have room if you want to come and show off the cool stuff that you're making. Hey, be it in progress or otherwise, it doesn't cost you anything, and you can meet some really awesome makers just like myself and others. And if you don't have anything to exhibit, you can still go and join for the day and explore everybody else's projects and hey, maybe get a little bit of excitement to finish yours or start a new one. Not that we have enough projects already. We don't judge around here for that. While it is only one day this year, they are working toward a two day event and hey, maybe that'll come next year. So if you guys are in the Orange County, California area and want to go to an awesome maker fair that is put on by an awesome friend of the channel and a great friend of mine, make sure to head over to the Orange County Maker Fair on the 21st of October. I wish I could see you there, but we have done a lot of traveling. I am very stressed out and uh, that's okay. We saw a lot of great things at the East Coast Rep Rap Festival 2023, the last East Coast Rep Rap Festival to ever happen. We'll talk about that a little bit more in the episode, but stay tuned because there's a ton of coverage coming out. And while we missed a lot of companies and makers that I wanted to talk to because we just simply ran out of time. I am hoping that uh, those of you that wanted to get an interview that didn't, reach out to me. Maybe we'll get you on a podcast instead. But hey, enough of this. Let's get into fixing some fails. How can I make this better? We've got a Prusa i3 MK3S with a 0.4 nozzle with Duramic. I, I think that's how you say it. 3D print filament with two filament changes. We've got a name card here, which has Remy Card Trader, sports and games with the R in purple, the letters in white, and the actual piece in black. A couple of things here. The best first thing to do is use a font that is actually designed for 3D printing. If you can't do that, make sure the letters are at least like 0.3 millimeters wide at their minimum width if you can. Utilizing the Arachne engine, which is developed by Ultimaker's Cura team, and then ported into Prusa Slicer, you should be able to get detail finer than the tip of the nozzle, but the smaller it is, the less likely it is to actually look okay. So instead, you would want to have the letters be as large as possible. If you are looking for a font that is actually designed for 3D printing and laser cutting, might I recommend Font. It's actually the font that we use at 3D Musketeers. Actually, if you go to our website, anything that is not a header or something like that, like all the main text is actually Font. It is a font originally designed for laser cutters, but is easily adapted into a 3D printer font because all the line widths are pretty much the same. The E's and the C's have enough variation, as well as quite a few of the letters are adopted to be more laser cutter and 3D printer friendly. As for getting the detail between things like that ampersand and the G and the A, the M, the E, and the S, where you have a little bit of stringing there, when you do find detail like that, cutting your temperature down might be of value. And if you are just running the MK3S stock, I do recommend 
dumping those temps a little bit especially on that high detail stuff it is good to lower those temps that way it'll keep it from stringing it is also really valuable to make sure that you have z hop enabled and there is actually enough z hop here so that your nozzle isn't just dragging across the other piece. To even further make this part look good, I would recommend actually ironing the top surface. That'll clean everything up a little bit and make life just a little bit easier. As for the R, the purple looks good, so I'm not so sure that I would change any of that. These type of signs can be a little bit complicated if it's not designed properly. Using fonts like Arial and Times New Roman are just simply not designed for this and will often end up looking, well, kind of bad overall. And that's not what we're looking for, obviously. So look at using a proper font that would work for this. If you can't do that because it's not within the brand guide that you're working with, you can try to use some horizontal size compensation, which is only accessible via the expert settings inside of Prusa Slicer. And it will be listed under the advanced tab where you can see XY size compensation. By adding some to this, you could actually increase the XY size of the individual pieces. However, they're going to end up looking kind of bloated if you do more than a very, very small amount. So if you are just going to do some XY size compensation here inside of Prusa Slicer, make sure that you're just doing the absolute bare minimum. You don't want to do more than you actually need. Fixing this bottom layer. I thought it was a flow problem, but after calibrating E steps, it's still an issue. Let's take a look. Well, you see this bottom layer doesn't look great. I would guess that we actually have a bit of a speed problem when it comes to infill. See, the actual lines around the outside of the printer look pretty good. The perimeters around the CT3D.XYZ look good, but the infill itself just doesn't look all that great. We can see on one of their previous posts that they were having an issue on this well, Bitcoin, where it's definitely an issue with not being the right distance from the bed, hopefully, because I really hope this is not a top layer and instead a bottom layer. Okay, it is a bottom layer, so there is that. And that would kind of track here as well, but this should not be a bridge, where it is a bridge here. And as far as bridging goes, that's actually not bad. But we can see that the B is not where it needs to be. And I don't believe that we're under extruding. It, this realistically could just be something to do with the Z offset. We covered Z offset and bed level in a couple of recent videos. Um, we'll card to the Z offset since I think that one is more likely and we'll link to bed leveling or more specifically bed tramming in that description down below. If that is something that you want to take a look at and hey, while you're down there, leave a like because, you know, helps channel out immensely and doesn't cost you a thing and subscribe if you don't mind. I think we've earned it. So how fixable is this? One of the wires for the heat block broke mid print last night. I'm not really in a position to buy a replacement. So does anyone have suggestions on how to repair it? No, it is not repairable. There is not much that you can do to fix this. The reason that this occurred in the first place is because you don't have the right cable strain relief. So when your hot end is moving back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, the wires on the heater themselves are slowly wearing out and starting to break. That's what's happened here. To the user, and I will comment, on it, I will be more than happy to send you a brand new heater. In fact, I've got quite a few of them here in inventory at absolutely no cost to you. I know that it can be tough sometimes, especially in this industry, because it can seem very financially taxing as we look at what upgrades to do, what printers to buy. And with a lot of the good printers costing a lot of money, there might not be a lot of money left over for things like spare parts, upgrades, time, filament, and more. So. You know, hey, if you do reach out, I'll be happy to send you something because I get what this is like. I've been there before and I had a nice person help me out a couple of years ago back when uh, things weren't so hot around here. And, you know, if I can pay it forward, I'm more than happy to. But this is a stock reality hot end. Uh, we can tell because of the way of the red. It's the generic hot end used on a lot of Creality printers and actually a lot of printers, period, these days because it is ubiquitous, it is affordable, and uh, by and large, they do actually work pretty well. The thing to note here is to replace it properly, you want to make sure that you cut the capped on tape that is right there. It's like the PEI tape. That way you can separate the thermistor from the heater. That way you don't also actually end up breaking 
the thermistor. The problem that we have here, though, is that this heater is probably not coming out without a fight. See, they're designed to be taken out and put in when it's all hot. So you might need to have a lighter or a small little butane torch as well. Those are relatively affordable and cannot legally be shipped through the mail. So I can't help you out there, but I'll be happy to send you a couple of heaters and maybe a thermistor or two because eh, likelihood is that might also be a problem. But if you were expecting it to be expensive, they're really not. You can get a pack of quite a few of them for only a couple of bucks on Amazon. And in fact, we'll link to uh, one or two in the description down below that we actually like and would recommend to those that are trying to get extra parts on a budget. Because yeah, 3D printing is not always that cheap at the end of the day. Removing resin from a Fresnel lens. I find myself in the unfortunate position where I have incurred a resin spill on the Fresnel lens of my Mars 3 Pro. How would I go about cleaning up without ruining my printer? Any thoughts? Well, if the resin has not yet cured, get that wiped up with alcohol ASAP. If the resin has cured, this one is going to be an unfortunate level of pain that you're going to run through. It's not simple. And if the Fresnel lens is glass, then it shouldn't be that difficult. But my best guess is that this Fresnel lens is actually going to be plastic. A plastic razor blade, or if you are very, very careful, a metal razor blade might be able to remove this resin without damaging the Fresnel lens under it. But chances are, it's probably a goner. It's why when it comes to resin printing, we do recommend putting some sort of protective film over the screen. And yes, while it does end up reducing that UV light transfer, it might increase your layer times by, you know, a couple of tenths of a second. It makes sure that if you have a resin spill like this, it hopefully doesn't end up all over the screen and or Fresnel lens because this is a monumental pain in the butt to deal with. It does appear that one of the commenters says that you could try a vat clean and use scotch tape to peel it off. I think I would try to take it off with alcohol and a towel first before I go that route, but yeah, um, you definitely want to do this very, very carefully. If the Fresnel lens is plastic, chances are you're just going to mess it up. But if it is plastic, you have nothing to lose. It's already broken as it is. You might as well learn if you're also going to learn from your wallet as well. Next up, a fail submitted from Fan Baloo, who said this might be something that we would like to cover. Let's take a look. We have a Prusa Mini with PLA, and they've been getting issues with all of their prints, failing having this weird issue. What could it be? This is either a nozzle clog, or it is heat creep slash work hardening of the filament. This PLA does not appear to be pure PLA. It looks like there's either some glitter or might be some silk in the PLA as well. And if you are wondering how silk PLA is made, specifically Elixir, make sure you guys stay tuned because uh, we just got back from printed solid where we took a couple of days and hung out with Dave and crew after the East Coast Rep Rap Festival. Now, 3D Printopia. Yeah, more on that coming soon. We're going to talk all about branding and why that name change actually makes a lot more sense than you think on an upcoming podcast episode. So if that's something you guys want to see, definitely get subscribed. But we made Elixir. Yeah, real Elixir at Printed Solid. And yeah, the secret sauce for Elixir might surprise you, but it's a big reason as to why silk filaments in general have low layer adhesion. We actually talked about it last week on Print Fix Friday, where our Discord member Rod had an issue where his dragon actually stuck so well to the cool plate of his Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon that the layers ripped apart. But specifically on a part like this, we can see a lot of small areas that have retractions, and that can cause the filament to go in and out of the hot end quite a bit. This can create 
work hardening on the filament itself to where it might require more heat. If you are running really fast, it is always going to turn up the heat at least a couple of degrees to help melt that filament because that's where the heat needs to go into the filament. If the filament says 215 C, that's great. But if you print really, really fast, uh, you need to give it more heat so it gets to the right temperature at the center of the filament. In cases like this, it could be a bit of a combination of the two. You can work with your retraction settings, but it would be good to check to make sure that your nozzle isn't clogged. A great way to do this is to send the printer up a little bit and then just tell it to extrude some filament. The filament should drop straight down out of the nozzle. If it comes out with some sort of curvature to it, you likely have a bit of a clog. And at that point, a cold pull is the right move to do. We'll be doing an upcoming video as we start to do more of the basic series as we get toward the holiday season here in 2023 so the cold pull will be in that series stay tuned for that as well barring all of those options we would also want to check to make sure that our retraction settings are correct and that we're not moving it too fast and we're not moving it too far it is a lot to try and especially with the mini being that it is a bowden machine the filament is going to move a lot more in a bowden tube than it will move in a direct drive setup that has a lot to do with backlash in the bowden system as well as the heat that can be generated from a standalone hot end rather than one that is also sinking into an extruder. At least that's my general understanding. Uh, I would love to know other people's thoughts there because that one's always been a bit perplexing to me. I know the tube creates some level of backlash as it pressurizes and depressurizes, but hey, let me know your thoughts in those comments below. This is an interesting fail submitted from our Discord member, Aaron, who just saw this as he was scrolling through the ye old Facebooks. Ruined my print again from the Creality K1 Facebook group. This is a lot of filament knotting. And we've talked about filament knots before that it's not actually all that possible. There are a few times where filament knotting can happen. And I almost had one happen when we were at Printed Solid. So thankfully that didn't happen. Uh, but I'm kind of excited that it didn't because it was very, very close, but I caught it and we're good. But otherwise, filament is a continuous strand. It's never broken. And if it is broken, the spool is normally thrown away because, you know, it, it's garbage. You, you can't use it. Or at least in the case of printed solid, they actually toss what is good onto a shelf where staff can get it. They use it for internal prints so that they can get sample colors and all of that, or uh, just gets given away to people that come by. But there's enough wraps here that I believe this spool was either mistreated, dropped, or somehow just overall abused by the end user. If you do get a filament wrap like this, it is best to pause the print, pull the filament out of the hot end, and unspool, I don't know, at least a little bit. This one might need quite a bit of filament and then re-manually spool it to make sure that there's no knots. At that point, you can reload it into the printer, send it off, and get printing with purpose once again. I feel bad for Discord member Mad Cat USA who woke up to this problem. Those of you that have a Bowden printer might have had this happen once or twice. This is a Bowden connection failure where either the printer itself had enough back pressure, maybe a clog nozzle that caused the Bowden tube to force itself out of the connector or the connector itself just failed. Looking at the end of the Bowden tube right here, we can definitely see some wear and tear, which could lead to that connector not gripping onto that Bowden tube as well as you might think. The nice thing is theoretically, he can just retract all of that filament and it should be okay. Honestly though, I would not go through that effort. It is not worth the time to me, but those of you that do want a bit of a challenge, you are welcome to play 52 pickup when it comes to filament. On the downside, this does mean that you have to replace the entire Bowden tube. It's why we do often recommend that you cut your Bowden tubes a little bit long. Because in the case of something like this, you could just cut it shorter rather than having to get a brand new piece. Yes, that means that you have more backlash potential when you're dealing with Bowden printers, but to me, that extra backlash is kind of worth the effort to not go through the BS when it comes to having to replace the whole tube rather than just cutting a bit of it a little bit short. The other thing to check for is to make sure that the teeth inside of that Bowden tube connector are clean and not damaged because if they are, it is also good to replace that coupler as well. But hey, if you're going down that route, maybe it's time for a direct drive upgrade because why not? In for a penny, in for a pound. F 
these VAT screws. Boy, that's a, that's a mood. This happened to me on my Anycubic Monotude. Now it happened again, this time far worse, and I can't get it out. This is insane for such an expensive printer. One, that is not an expensive printer. I regret to inform you, it's just not. This looks like an Elegoo Saturn, and they're $500 to $800, which sounds like a lot of money, but there are resin printers that are a thousand times more expensive than this. Now, they're a thousand times larger in a lot of cases, but to be clear, this is still incredibly affordable for 3D printing. Even just a couple of years ago, resin printing was still insanely expensive, and only ever since Elegoo played the let's race to the bottom when it comes to making 3D printers and at the same time actually keeping the quality of the machines really good, we were all plenty happy paying a couple thousand dollars for a resin printer because the only other option from there was to go up to like 10 or 15,000 or go to a closed ecosystem. In this particular case, I have to agree with the top commenter that it looks like a cleanliness problem. See, we have to remember that one, resin is toxic and resin gets into everything, literally everything. And that can be a bit of a problem. If you get resin dripping into the threads of that screw, it's going to cure in there and you're gonna have a bad time. Even further, you got a bunch of crap in your vat now. And so whatever resin is in there needs to minimally be filtered and at the worst case, completely cured and thrown away. But you have to look at these machines more like medical devices that need to be kept incredibly clean. They need to be maintained properly and you need to treat them with some level of respect. I understand that might be difficult to hear because it's not easy hearing somebody tell you, hey, just be a little bit nicer to the machine and life will be good. But if you're at the point where you need to use a pair of needle nose pliers to get your screws out, there have been a couple of steps that have already occurred that have been messed up. And whether that's from an overfilled vat, whether that's from trying to clean parts and you got some drips on the screws, whatever it might be, it is still a problem that needs to be resolved before we look any further. The best thing to do at this point, as far as I'm concerned, is to cut that screw off, get the vat off that printer, and then use a pair of vice grips, something that is going to really grip onto that screw and go ahead and twist it out. From there, you can look at replacing it. I believe they're M3 threaded, but if I'm wrong, someone will correct me in those comments below. It's not fun, but there's not much you can do from there. You will also wanna make sure that you get an M3 three tap to go ahead and chase those threads back out and get rid of any gunk buildup that might exist because it's kind of important to make sure that your threads are clean so that this doesn't just happen again the next time. This is not a manufacturer flaw. I get that this is not a lot of fun and that this style of screw can be a monumental pain in the keister, but it's some of the cost cutting that was done to make this system more affordable and more accessible to the end user. So I'm sorry this happened to you. There's not much that I can do other than to tell you, hey, make sure it's clean. But I do want to give a massive thank you to all of our channel supporters who've made episodes like this possible, 108 episodes deep, and that's pretty awesome. And their names are listed right next to me at the $5 tier and higher. Thank you to what you all do, making these episodes possible, 108 of these deep. It's pretty awesome. Take a look right below me to see the entire Print Fix Friday series. And right next to that will be the teaser for the East Coast Rep Rep Festival 2023 with full videos starting next week. So stay tuned for that. That's all I have for you all today. Stay safe out there. Don't forget to call your loved ones. And as always, keep making awesome. Have a good one.